most wonderful time. Oh, hi, Notboard Gamers, and welcome back to Notboard Gaming. I'm your host, I'm Mark. Now, it really is that fantastic time of year. It's Christmas time, and in just a few days, we'll all be rushing to our trees to find out what Santa Claus has left under the tree. And so today, I'm going to be reviewing a game that many of you may be getting as a Christmas present. You may find it under your tree. If not, you may want to go out and find the game. And that game is... Dwellings of Eldervale, published by Breaking Games and designed by Luke Laurie. Oh, look at the inside of the box lid there, fantastic. So Dwellings of Eldervale is a one to five player worker placement game set in the once lost magical and mythical land of Eldervale. Now this has caused a bit of a stir since it started arriving to Kickstarter backers and some retail outlets as well. I've been diving deep into Dwellings of Eldervale. So, Grab yourself an eggnog, sit down, let's find out what you get in the box, a little bit about the gameplay, and my final thoughts on Dwellings of Elder Vale by Breaking Games, designed by Luke Laurie. <laughs> After a successful Kickstarter last year, Dwellings of Eldervale started arriving at backers' doors about six to eight weeks ago. Now, I didn't back this game last year, but I did manage to pick a, a, a copy of the deluxe version up from Games Law. Now, my mistake there was only going for the deluxe version. Had I known now what I know then, I would have wanted to go for the legendary version. I'll explain a little bit more about the difference uh, in, a, in, a, in a wee while. So what is Dwellings of Eldervale? Well, it says that it's a worker placement game, and it is a worker placement game, Jim, but not as we know it. You see, it's a worker placement, tableau building, tile laying, resource management, monster fighting, combat, house building game for one to five players. And in the solo game, which is obviously the game, the version of the game that I've been playing, you're going to be playing against a pretty smart AI called the Ghosts of Eldervale. <laughs> Before we get into the actual gameplay and the solo gameplay, let's talk about the box itself and what you get in the box. Now, if you've been watching any of, looking at any of the content on the forums, etc., you'll know that it's an exceptionally well packaged product. So, if you look at this clip above me now, you can see there's a game, an end game I've finished, fully laid out, and there we go, bang! That's how it all very, very neatly packs away. Many, many games use game trays, but Dwellings of Elder Vale really, really does use them in a very, very good way. Let's do a very brief tour of what you get inside the box of the Deluxe Edition. So here we have my lovely packed away game. And as you can see, everything perfectly fits in the box. We've got the various game boards. We've got the rather good rule book. Not, not totally comprehensive. We'll talk about that in a bit. Some player guides. Here are your element cards, and there are two trays of those, and you will choose so many elements each game that you play. But look at them, look at them, they're stacked away. All the, the tokens are in the bottom, the cards are at the top. It's just absolutely fantastic. Here, if you've got the deluxe version, we've got the nine monsters. Now, if you've got a standard version, you're going to get standees. Standees are also included in the deluxe and legendary versions as well. Um, so you can play them just with standees if you don't want the, uh, the, the minis, but you can see that all of the monster minis in the deluxe version are packaged away in this box. There's nine in the one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the deluxe version, plus a dragon down below as well. Uh, I'll come on to this in a little while. Now, here are all your various factions. You have, I think it's eight different factions. Yeah, eight factions, all in these wonderful boxes, and they're all self-contained. So what you would do is you would snap the lid off these boxes, and there you would have your various player pieces underneath. And these lids also act as your kind of faction guide as well, and there's two sides to them. So there'll be a slightly easier side to play with, and then a slightly more difficult side to play with. They're all asymmetrical. When you've done, when you finish the game, you put all the pieces back inside, and then you just snap the lid back on. And that um, potentially has its own issue, and we'll come on to that in a wee while. And as you can see, there are eight of those that fit so well inside 
the box. This is just great. This is what you want to see from game trays. Potentially, other than Eagle Griffin games, this is potentially the best use of game trays I've seen. There's also a number of tokens that you will use inside the game. So there are uh, jewels, there are scrolls, there are potions, there are hammers, the swords, there's some coins, and there are some magic cards as well. And there are two of these troughs, and essentially I think there are 60 magic cards. If you don't sleeve them, they'll all fit in one, but if you do sleeve them, you can use them in two. And here you can see I've also got some paper money in there, but I'll not need that because I've got the actual metal coins I use as well. Now underneath all this, there is even more. There's the various player tiles, and you're going to choose so many of these each and every game, because as I say, it is a tile lane board, and there's two stacks there, plus this removable, which acts as like your in-game stack as well, because you don't use everything, you start pulling them out throughout the game, a little trough for you there to discard your tokens. So again, it becomes an integral part of playing the game. Underneath this, we have the Mother of Dragons, if you've got that. Um, which is uh, uh, kind of a mini expansion for it. We have various tokens, beads, the monster dice. We have the watcher token, which we will use in the single player game. Uh, here are the standees. So if you want to use standees, you can use those instead of the minis with those bases. Here is one, um, uh, one uh, mercenary you can use. There's a gap there for another, and we'll come onto the gaps and this box actually right now. You see, whether you get the standard game or the deluxe game or the legendary game, <laughs> It's all the same box size, and uh, if you haven't got Legendary, then everything in the box kind of reminds you that you haven't got Legendary. So I've got Deluxe. I, say, I really wish I'd have gone for Legendary. Uh, it's, it's, it, you know, at the time I just made a, uh, a decision on what I was going to go for. This here is just a kind of a space holder, and every time I look in my box, that reminds me that I don't have the extra nine monsters that come with the Legendary, and that's that's a bit of a kicker there. Same with this gap here. Well, that's for another mercenary. Uh, you have to buy the mercenary, which I think I managed to do online. Uh, it was a Kickstarter thing, but I managed to do that online, so hopefully I'll get that soon. I think that's the Minotaur. Over here, you see these? These circles here, they're for the sound bases that come in the Legendary Edition. They don't come in the Standard, they don't come in the Deluxe. Again, every time I look into my box, I just cry a little bit because I do not have that those those legendary components and at the moment there's no way for me to get those legendary components then over here we have the various cards that we use for so the bad guy cards uh we have the solo deck which is the ghost of Elder eldervale deck here and then we have our various kind of faction cards here that we can choose from so <laughs> other than kind of reminding me every time i open the box this is potentially one of the best package games that i've ever ever see if it's not a cheap game to buy and if you're wondering where your money goes then your money has gone on creating an absolutely comprehensive um, uh, and total storage solution that makes the game uh, you know completely easy to kind of get out completely easy to put away um, because everything just fits ever so nicely exactly where it needs to fit there we go look at that so we'll talk about the kind of the issue that uh, people have got with um, with these player boards in a, in a wee while but let's have a look at a little bit now about how the game plays <laughs> So Dwellings of Eldervale, as you can see, once I've set the game out here, really doesn't take that much time due to that uh, wonderful storage system. It takes less than 10 minutes to set the game up. And the aim of Eldervale is you're going to choose one of the 16 factions. Now, as I said, there are eight faction boxes with double sides on the lip that creates 16 factions, each with their own asymmetry, each with the element of uniqueness there as well. In the main game, you're going to be playing against other factions, so in the multiplayer game against other factions, and trying to find out who discovers kind of the most treasures and rediscovers this one lost mythical and magical land of Eldervale. In the solo game, you're going to be playing against the solo AI, which is the ghosts of Eldervale. And these are the ghosts from when the when the uh, area was uh, kind of rampant with magic, etc. They've been laid dormant for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, and you turning up and trying to rediscover the land has reawakened their interest in Eldervale, and they're going to try and stop you from exploring this wonderful landscape full of treasures, full of ghosts and also full of monsters. 
So once you set up the board, and it really is an absolute breeze, you're going to choose, first of all, your faction, and also um, a three, in the solo game, three other elements that you're going to choose as well. Now your faction has a colour that denotes the element. That makes four in total, and that means there are going to be four corresponding monsters that appear on the map, depending on the elements that you've chosen there. Uh, and as I say, the aim of the game over a, an undetermined number of rounds is to kind of maximise your spread amongst this land and try and get as many victory points as possible. I say undetermined because the game will play out until one of two things happens. Either, either you place every dwelling in your barracks, if you like, uh, or the, the ghost place every dwelling, and then another full round will uh, kind of occur and then the game will be over, or every map tile has been laid. And once the final map tile has been laid, then that allows another round, and that means that the game is over. To help you make your decision on which faction you want to choose, there's a fantastic appendix that comes with the book, and that lists each and every faction, both sides of there, tells you whether they're easy, moderate, or hard to play with, along with the details on every single card. And the round structure is really, really straightforward. Essentially, on your go, you're going to take one of two actions. Only two. Yeah, two actual actions. There are a number of free actions, if you like. The first action you can take is to place a unit on the map, and you're going to start the game with three fairly basic worker units. You can kind of summon more and, and, and create more as the game goes on. Uh, so you're going to place a, a unit, and then you can get some relative kind of uh, bonuses based on where you place it. Uh, and then, or the other action you can take is to regroup. So if you placed all of your actions, all of your units on the board, you don't have to have placed all of them because it can be quite strategic to do an early kind of regroup depending on what you're trying to achieve, then you will pull all those workers back. So that sounds fairly rudimentary, and it is. The game states that it's simple to play, and it is absolutely simple to play, but there's a real depth in what you're playing as well. There are a number of free actions you can take on top of your main action as well. You can discard a treasure token to gain uh, the depicted resources. So when you go on a map tile, generally if it's an elemental tile, you're going to get a treasure token. You can discard that to get the resource. You can slot a treasure token token onto cards, so part of the game is buying these cards and building up your tableau and you can put element tokens on there. You can play a spell card, you can complete a quest. If you're playing with mercenaries, you can hire a mercenary, or if you're playing with the tactics, you can uh, re uh, kind of restore an exhaust tactic token as well. So, the heart of the gameplay is surprisingly simple. Don't let that simplicity fool you. You see, Dwellings of Eldervale. <laughs> is unlike any kind of Euro worker placement I've played before. The element of potential combat that's here, the tableau building from it, uh, that it that is included in here, the tile laying, means that you have this very dynamic shifting landscape. And if you're used to playing Euros where you have a deeply strategic thought on how you're gonna play, you're gonna have to shift that to more of a tactical kind of approach here because of the way that the, the kind of dynamic way that everything moves around on the board. Your long-term strategies may play out throughout the game, but you will find a more tactical approach is possibly the best way forward as the board and the elements on the board absolutely change. So after you've taken your turn, what's going to happen is the ghosts of Eldervale are going to take their turn. Now, they uh, we have this kind of uh, AI deck here that uh, dictates what the ghosts are going to do. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll just show you on the board in a second what uh, a player can do and how a ghost can uh, will, will operate. And that'll give you a good idea of what you do as the game progresses. Finally, to get these kind of points that you need to um, make sure that you try to win the game, you're going to have to do a number of things. Over here is the element board. Now, the element board, kind of the stronger you get in particular elements, the further your marker will move up that board, and that will dictate your kind of end game scoring for certain things, things like your dwellings or the tableau cards that you've got. Dwellings themselves, at some point, you're going to start converting your workers uh, into little houses, uh, which is a great thing. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and depending on where you place those, they will score you points because if you place them adjacent to a ruin, that's these brown tiles that you'll see, uh, you score two points for those. And also adjacent to anybody else's dwelling, that will also score you two points. But also, depending on where you finish on the element track, you will score uh, points based on how many uh, how many dwellings you've got in that in those particular areas as well. You have your tableau cards as well. So these tableau cards, you will buy them as the game goes on. They will activate sometimes throughout the game, or you will pay to activate them. I'll put a worker on there to activate them. And depending on how many of those that you've got and how far up the element board you are, then you will get some victory points at the end of the game. Um, so you have these kind of abilities to score in-game points as you're progressing through the game by placing dwellings, by having combat with people. And combat, well, yeah, I really like the combat. It might not be for everyone. 
everybody. It's a bit of dice chucking, but I really like the combat. Uh, so yeah, there's certain magic cards and tableau cards that will give you um, points throughout the game. There are quest cards that will give you points throughout the game, but your main end game score, your main scoring is going to come at the end of the game, depending on how far and how successful your spread throughout Elder Vale has been. So here we go. I've set the game up for a solo game. I have the Mosswood Trolls as my faction here, along with five starting kind of magic cards there, or uh, yeah, the magic cards, but the magic and quests in there. My element card, which tells me what I need to do to either recruit, to gather, or to um, uh, build dwellings. Over here on the left-hand side, I have the uh, the Ghosts of Eldervale board with their three kind of starter cards from the AI deck. They start with five magic cards, and they also randomly choose an element card, which moves them one up on the element track, so they can see that any uh, points they score on the red element are going to get them two, and on, for me, on the green so far, that's two. That will go up as the game goes on. Now, the AI does not collect resources throughout the game. You're going to collect resources. The AI collects these magic cards, which you'll add to there, which are worth victory points at the end, and also tableau cards as well from the tableau deck. So, as I mentioned earlier, playing the game, is really, really straightforward. You're going to take one of your workers and you're going to place it on the board. Now, in the first round, until you do your first regroup, you can almost literally place it anywhere and it will not trigger a battle. In subsequent rounds, if I was to place my worker, once I've regrouped, in any uh, hex adjacent to that particular monster, then that monster would rush into my hex. Same with the AI uh, on subsequent rounds as well. It would rush into the hex and trigger a battle. Also, if the worker, if the AI had a worker already in that particular hex there, and I place my worker in that particular hex, that would also trigger a battle in subsequent rounds. But as I mentioned, in the first round, it doesn't do anything. So let's have a look at what I can do up on the board itself. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the kind of the early part of the game until you do your first regrouping and bring your workers back to your board, um, you don't trigger any battles. Um, but once that has happened, once you've regrouped, then you will. So to start off with, the early the early kind of placements are going to be about kind of gathering resources. And you can see we've got the element tiles, which are all these colours here, and then the brown ones are ruins tiles, and they have special actions. For example, I can trade any two resources for three magic cards there and discard one. I trade any two resources for two gold, and gold is a wild resource. Here, I will place another tile on the deck. And remember, once that tile stack is done, um, then that's, uh, that triggers the end of the game. Here, I can pay the cost and put a dwelling on there, and that one, uh, the portal, will allow me to summon workers as well. So that's another way to get your workers. So, say I take my worker. Here we go. We've got this little green worker, and I'm going to place him over here on uh, him or her, uh, over there on the red tile. Okay, so what I do now is I now take one of these, tile, these uh, treasure tokens. So let's say I take this one, and this is going to give me the ability to get one jewel or one hammer. I place it down in my storage tray down here, and you can see there are four slots, and you can have no more than four resources in kind of in storage. And why would you want to store them? Well, you see, you can either trade these resources tokens in for actual resources, and you start the game with one of each, except a coin, or you may well get tableau cards, which allow you to slot that resource token onto them, which will activate each round if you do activate it. So, on this particular one, I've taken my first go, I've placed him, I'm going to trade that in, and I'm going to get, as it says, this one says, either a jewel or a hammer. Let's put that in the tray, and I'm going to get an additional jewel token and you're limited by the number of resources that you can get that's it that's my first go in there doesn't sound too exciting and you know what in the early game it really is about kind of setting the scene a little bit and that's okay you still feel like there's a mild sense of progression already on my first go i've created a resource i do have uh, a worker on this particular tile. Now, at the end of my go, when I was to, if I was to regroup and bring my guys back onto my card here, if I had three, um, uh, three jewels at the end of my go, and I, I bring my guy onto the card here, one of my guys onto the card, and I put it on the dwelling, I could then pay three jewels, and I could convert him, this worker, into a dwelling. And to do that, <laughs> this is great. You take one of these little roof tokens, let me show you, let me show you, and you put it on there and you create, look at that, it's a little hat that goes on him that makes him into a, uh, a dwelling. So there we go, we've got the dwellings of Elderville. By doing that, that's going to score me end game points depending on how far up the red track I am. But you can see here, we've got two element uh, markers up there. Some tiles have one, some have two. That means that my marker will move kind of two spots up the element track. I'm not on red at the moment, so I would already put that up 
on number two up there, increasing my end game ability there. So that's what you can do in terms of that. You can also, um, as I say, you can also summon as well. So if I put it onto the portal tile or back onto this, my element card when I'm regrouping and I pay the cost that's either apportioned on there. So if you look at there, um, to get my dragon, which gives me a teleport ability and uh, more dice to throw in combat. That's two jewels and a scroll. To get my wizard, um, which allows me to put it on certain hexes on the board, that gives me two potions and a scroll. Sorry, I have to pay two potions and a scroll. To get my warrior, which gives me more of an increased battle ability, two hammers and a, uh, a sword. And to increase my number of workers when I summon, I pay one resource, two resource, or three of any resource, and I can collect my workers. I can also kind of I say put a worker on here when I regroup and get a hammer resource and each one is different on each of the element cards or put one on here to get a dwelling as well. So you can see that there are starting to be a number of kind of mechanisms that will start to marry together. How many of the resource tokens you've got, how many workers are out there, when is it good to pull the workers back? Also, where do I place my workers as well? Because do I want to actually battle a bad guy or battle the AI? One final thing to mention in the solo game is when you've placed your worker on a particular tile, what you will also do is place the watcher token on there as well. Now this watcher token will then dictate where the AI is going to place their pieces because now we've had our go, or you know, I could have had my go, I've placed a tile, I could have had a combat, I could have I don't know, uh, you know, put another tile down, I could have put a dwelling on, but I've gone on there and I've taken a red tile. Now I've had my go, it's now over to the AI's turn, the ghosts of Eldervale. So now it's the AI's turn, okay? So what we've got here is we have the Ghost of Eldervale board, and you can see I've randomly placed element tokens here, and that, that's exactly what you do. Uh, and the more of these element tokens they get, they will move up this track, and that will give them bonuses throughout the game. So maybe they'll move up the Glory track, which is this track above here. Uh, maybe they'll get some magic cards, or maybe they'll get an element card. The more element cards they get, the further up the appropriate element track they move. And also here, if we look, we also have kind of, you've laid out all of the uh, the ghost kind of units here, and we're gonna roll a die to find out which unit we're going to play. So let's roll a die, and we got a number five. That means I'm gonna take this unit here. See, one, two, three, be one of these units, and that card, four and five there, six there. So you take the very left one, and here it tells you where you are going to place it. That is where I played my uh, place the watcher token, so that's where my current unit is. This is the tile where I'm going to place it. Let's have a look at how that works. Okay, so here we go. We see that I'm going to place it down to the bottom left of where the watcher token is. Hmm, well, you see, the watcher token is here. There is no tile down to the bottom left. If that's the case, then I would place that worker token that unit token for the ghost on my same tile. However, if the watcher token had been there and I'd placed my piece up there, of course, it would place it there. It would take the leftmost, if they're available, um, token, and it would place it on its, on its place on the board, moving up that track. But however, this has created quite a good opportunity to talk about how battles work. As I mentioned in the early game, before you've done a first regroup, you won't um, have any battles, but this, Let's talk about battles because suddenly we've got somebody invading on one of my tiles. Now, I really, really like this battle element and this is where it starts to kind of diverge from uh, a lot of Euros uh, in the fact that it becomes a dice chucking game for the battle element. And that's quite an important bit as well because if you don't like any kind of luck based die rolls then this game may not be what you're looking for from here because it can radically alter your strategy. You can absolutely get knocked off course by a few bad die rolls. So how does the battle work? Well, so here we, as we saw, we've got two kind of small workers on one hex. So that means that we're each going to pull the appropriate number of dice. So for every either worker or wizard I've got on that hex, I will get one die. For every um, warrior I've got on there, I will get an additional two die. And for every dragon I've got on there, I will get three die. And that's it. You will build that up to a maximum of six die. And if there are, if you have any dwellings in any adjacent hexes, that will add one die onto your roll for each dwelling in an adjacent hex. But if you have units in an adjacent X, you can also drag them in as well. So you want to get up to that maximum of six if possible, but there is a good chance you lose. Same will happen for the ghosts. Um, no matter whatever units they've got on there, they will get the appropriate number of die. But if they have any in adjacent squares, then absolutely they will always bring them in. Sorry, adjacent Xs, they will always bring them into battle, whereas we can make the choice. Uh, and same happens for them with the dwellings as well. And each monster, if you've been, if a monster is activated and you're taking a battle with a monster on the bottom, the bottom, 
the monster's card, there is the number of dice that the monster will roll. So in the solo game, you could be rolling for up to three parties. You will collect the relevant numbers of dice, you will chuck them, and whoever has the highest die will win the battle. So if you've all rolled sixes, then it was down to the next die. If uh, one's rolled a five, one's rolled a four, one's rolled a three, Mm, that's it. Whoever's rolled the five will then win that battle. The others are defeated. The monsters will get uh, knocked off the board and the other parties will go to the underworld. So it becomes a little bit of a <laughs> kind of a crapshoot in terms of uh, the dice play there and it can really throw your strategy off. I'll show you a very quick roll on the dice. So let's assume that I've got um, three dice available to me because I have three units that are able to fight. That the ghosts of Eldervale have got two dice available for them, but the monster's already on there as well, and they've got four dice. So we're going to roll our dice in the tray here, and I'll show you how this works. So let's separate these. Oh, look at this. Okay, so <laughs> this hasn't gone uh, my way or the monster's way in any great shape or form and this is a really good indicator of what can happen. So the grey die of the monsters and you can see his highest number of pips is five up there. You can see the green die of mine and I, my highest number of pips is four. But down here with only two dice, the least number of dice is the AI and they've rolled two sixes. That means they've won this battle. So even if they'd have rolled a six and a one, it doesn't matter. The highest die in the <laughs> that you come to first is the one that wins the party and that's it so you can mitigate against this you can if you've got um, uh, swords then you can throw more dice in there up to a maximum of six there are certain cards that allow you to change the face of dice but if say for example here we'd got two people that had rolled a six then it would move down to the very next one uh, so I'd already been knocked out. We know that that worker's die was a six down there. So I'd already been knocked out. The monster had rolled a six and then two fours. Again, the worker would have won. And that's how it works. You go down on that progressive basis. And that is kind of the real kind of unknown in this game is that combat, no matter how many dice you've got, is not always going to go your way. So after, after combat has finished, what's going to happen is my unit and the monster's unit, well, the monster would get returned to the map, but my unit is going to get taken off the board and put into the underworld here. There we go. Uh, and I will get one sword back into my resources <laughs> uh, and that gives me the ability to at least potentially increase my dice, but they will stay there until I regroup. What's also going to happen is that the AI is going to move one up the element track, uh, sorry, one up the glory track if it's after the first regrouping. And there we go. That gives them two victory points already. They're kind of marching away up the uh, victory point track. And that's the key thing at the end of the game. You want to position yourself so you're trying to get more victory points than the other players. Once you've got enough resources and you go on the relevant uh, hex, it will give you the ability to buy tableau cards. Now, if you're playing in the basic game, the only place you can do that is in the dungeon. And that means that when you buy these tableau cards, you're also putting a hex onto the board, which goes through the hex pile even quicker. Uh, there is a way to kind of mitigate against that in if you play one of the mini expansions like the Oracle. So you're going to add an Oracle tile on there, which gives you the ability to buy either a magic card or an, uh, uh, an adventure card here, or one of these uh, element cards. And these element cards do various different things. So I've just picked three out at random here. First one here is, uh, this is the door for the, um, uh, for the yellow element. And you can see it's got a little space because that means I could slot my token on there. So when I regroup, if I put a worker on there, I will always get one scroll. And if I'm the highest up on the yellow track, I will get whatever token goes in there. But that card is going to cost me two jewels. If we look at these cards here, uh, we've got this, which is going to cost four scrolls, but this says I can discard up to three magic cards from my hand and then draw the same number of cards. Uh, if you have an orb on this card, gain one victory point for each card drawn. And orbs you get by either going up the glory track or going to the top of the element tracks. They're a scarce resource. I say that's going to cost me four scrolls to get that card. And this card is going to cost me three scrolls here uh, for the solstice shrine. And at the end of your turn, if units occupy three or more adjacent realms in a straight line, gain two victory cards. And as you buy these cards, they're going to do one of two things. First of all, they're going to splay out into your tableau. So the more cards that you get, potentially the stronger you get each and every round. But also, for every card you buy, you will move it, your marker one up on the element track on depending on which card you buy. So that gives you the idea that you need to get kind of progression on there. So you can see that you've got this kind of melange of kind of um, mechanisms starting to work together. You've got kind of a longer term strategy that you're trying to achieve. Am I going to try and place more dwellings on there because dwellings get me good points at the end of the game? But if I'm going to do that, I need to be higher up on the element track. And the way to get up on the element track is potentially to 
get more cards into my um, uh, into my hand. But of course, as I place dwellings, I can move up on the element track as well. There are parts on the glory track for when you win battles that will move you up and up on the element track, but also give you things like orbs and additional resources as well. And of course, let's not forget the monsters, because these things come out onto the map whenever you pull out a, a hex tile that's got a lair symbol on there. See, that's a yellow one there. So once that's pulled out, I will then put that monster onto the board and they will shift around on the board. If anybody, after the first regrouping, places their, uh, their units adjacent in a hex adjacent to a monster, that monster will rush in and a battle will ensue. And it can be quite tense to do that. And what this does is it makes the monster move around the map. And of course, they can be defeated by die rolls and you get slightly different bonuses for doing that there. But they can also be brought back onto the board as well. So generally in the opening game, you're going to start with one monster on. I pull out the, uh, the kind of dark uh, layer, so it's this dark monster on. But throughout the rest of the game, ultimately, all of the monsters will come on the board and they will play a part in trying to defeat me, trying to move me around the board uh, and also trying to defeat the ghosts as well. The other major element to talk about are these kind of magic cards here. And these give you access to various things that will trigger throughout your game. Uh, they can be spent as resources as well, but there'll be things like spells. So this one is, let's see, um, here we go. I've got the Swirling Vision magic card here. Play on your turn, discard any number of magic cards from your hand and draw magic cards equal to the amount discarded plus one. So that gives you a, a way to kind of cycle through your magic cards. Or this one here, if I play pay two uh, swords or I'm at uh, the third space on the red element track, I can access Blood Rage. Play on your turn, gain one glory, so that moves me up the glory track. Uh, an epic battle is triggered in the underworld. Units may join from Elder Vale and already areas. Each player must participate. So that's a way to trigger battles and potentially get more cards. And you will play these as the game goes on. So there are kind of spell cards. There are quest cards as well, which when you've done the, if you've got the card and you've done the requisite uh, action on there, then you will potentially score points uh, for that. So this is Illuminate the, uh, the Prism. To complete this quest, you must have at least two gems in your supply. Gain one victory point for each gem in your supply. And that's good. So if you've got five gems in your supply and you play that card, you're going to get five victory points. And then there are kind of end game cards as well, which you've got this little eye symbol on here. And this one says peace. And it says at the end of the game, this card is worth three victory points is your, if your marker is in last place or tied on the lowest number of space on the glory track. And throughout the game, you're going to get and cycle through these cards. But also what's going to happen is whenever the... Um, um, the ghost of Elder Vale, the solo AI, should gain a, uh, a resource. They gain one of these magic cards as well. They don't use the power on the back, but at the end of the game, they're going to be worth one victory point to the ghost. The ghost is also going to, throughout the game, depending on which card has been pulled. So let's look at this one. For example, if the ghost had, um, had highlighted, uh, had activated this particular card and placed a unit that was underneath, on top of this card, then it would place a unit in the, uh, in the dungeon, and then it would roll for an adventure card. And what that would do, roll the dice, see what the corresponding uh, icon is on its board, and it would pull an adventure card from... Uh, the the storage deck into here and move up the relevant number of spaces onto the uh, uh, on the victory point chat track. Of course, when it comes to dwellings as well, they get exactly the same number of points. What you will find is the AI starts to lead fairly early in the game, but it's not always about that kind of in-game lead because the game ends, as I say, when you've uh, played the last tile. Uh, last text from the board or the final dwelling has been placed one more round takes place and then you're going to come to, then you're going to come to the end game scoring and end game scoring is going to be dependent on how many dwellings you've got on your board on what kind of hexes those dwellings are on and whereabouts your marker is on the elemental track as well the further up the better it is for you it's also going to be based on how many tableau cards you've got and that can be dictated again by how many you can use by how many dwellings you've got and where your marker is up on that elemental board there are certain end game cards as well that you can get for magic cards which will also add to the score the AI will score a lot of these things as well. You know, so he will count the number of magic cards he's got. He will count the AI cards, the uh, sorry, the elemental adventure cards that he's got, the number of dwellings that he's got, and it's re it becomes this real battle. I have won by fractions of well, not fractions of points, by just a few points. Uh, I have lost by one point. I have lost by many points. I have yet to win by many points because. The way that you kind of choose your faction, I go completely random. I literally just draw an element card and then I just choose a random side of the board and I will play the game accordingly. And the game is so dynamic that your strategy has to shift entirely throughout the game to play. <laughs> you can 
probably tell from watching this far that I really, really, really like this game. I like this game a lot. It has monopolized my table time. Um, when I put it away to potentially play or, or, or look at other games, I'm thinking about getting Dwellings of Eldervale back out. And I've only played the solo game. I may try and play the, um, the multiplayer game with my wife over the Christmas period. Um, there is just so much of interest going on in this game that I have yet to have a dull game. I maybe start out losing badly and then I gain massively, but I can still lose at the back end because the strategy has not, the eye strategy just hasn't been quite fine honed and tuned just enough to win the AI at the back end of it. There is just a joy in everything you get by putting this game out on the table. It looks fantastic. It's a breeze to put out with everything that comes with it. There is just, yeah, it kind of it scratches so many itches. You've got the kind of Euro itch that it scratches. You've got the, the tableau building of a game like, I don't know, maybe Wingspan, although this is just far in excess of anything Wingspan can do for me personally. Um, you've got the combat. I'm a huge kind of Kingdom Death Monster fan. So Rolling Dice and you know Eldritch Horror or Fortune and Glory. I like Rolling Dice in games. So I really like that random element by, you know, I also understand that it may not work for a lot of people as well. I like the, the kind of... Uh, dynamics that the monsters bring to the board as well. Uh, they really change the game depending on how they're moving around the board, whether they're rushing at you or the ghosts of Eldervale, the AI. It kind of, you know, makes the board a little bit more dynamic. The resource management is kind of cool. You know, understanding how long I'm going to keep this token for. Am I going to spend it? Am I going to gain the benefits from it? Or am I going to put it on a card? Working the tableau, building my dwellings as well and racking up those victory points. It's just a pure joy to play. And, you know, there are so many things right with this game that when I think about what's not quite right with it, it kind of, you know, oh, it's kind of difficult to do. But there are just a couple of things that may not appeal to everybody. See, let's start with the rule book. And the rule book is, is pretty good. In reality, I read through the rule book uh, once. I played the game. I played parts of it slightly wrong, went back to the rule book, went back into the game. And in my second game, probably 95% correctly, by my third game, everything was there. Anything I could not find in the rule book. Luke Laurie, the designer, is absolutely prevalent everywhere on in Facebook or on uh, BGG. So if you go to the Dwellings of Elder Vale Facebook group or you go on the solo BG forums, uh, solo board gamer forums on Facebook or wherever, I mean, you mentioned Dwellings of Elder Vale, Luke, like a magic genie, will pop up and, and cure those queries for you. Um, the rule book is very much set up for the uh, multiplayer game. So there are a few edge cases in the solo game where you just maybe want a little bit more clarity in there. But again, access to the forums or just playing it how you think you want to play it, you're not going to do massive amounts too wrong. Um, yeah, you will still get to the heart of the game there. One of the things that is not quite explicit in the rule book is um, the dominate monsters action. So there's an action uh, and it's, it, it comes out on a couple of cards where if something happens and you have the right amount of cards, then you can dominate the monster. That becomes one of your units. That means that you can potentially, as your monster, use this action that's got the chain icon in there. Unfortunately, in the rule book, it's not quite explicit that even if the... Uh, you think that maybe that chain action means that that action is only applicable if you dominate the monster. It's not. You, those monsters' actions happen each and every turn, and that's not quite explicit in the rule books. But that's me really kind of kind of skimming down to the bottom of what potentially is kind of wrong in there. I do think that you know the player aids are pretty pretty good. They give you a basic overview on on what you can do. They tell you what how the battle works and how you do scoring at the end. But a major omission in the rule books is the fact of how your dragon, your wizard, and your warrior works. So they have very specific rules which are detailed on page nine of the rule book. For example, the dragon can be placed up to two realms away from one of your units, not just adjacent. The wizard can be placed in any unoccupied realm in Elder Vale. Uh, and the warrior, if you have no other units in Elder Vale, the warrior may be placed directly in any occupied realm for the first placement. That would have been nice to see on this player aid, and certainly as you're getting used to the game you kind of forgetting those little rules as well. So if you did that, have been on the player aid. And that's kind of compounded by the fact that each faction and each side of the board has asymmetrical abilities. So you've got to remember the rules there. Remember to apply these asymmetric abilities as well at the same time. So I do think that the potential rules of play could have been a little bit more 
comprehensive. The other thing, which means the game might not be for everybody, is the dice play. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I love things like Kingdom Death Monster, I love Eldritch Horror, I love Fortune and Glory, so I like dice play in my games. I like the element of <clears throat> potential randomness that it introduces in there, but I also understand that that is not for everybody. A lot of Euro players like to obviously have a long-term strategy. They think, right, if I do this, 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 and they can work in this kind of, you know, in, 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 on a higher level than I can to forward plan their entire game. Of course, Dwellings of Elder Vale, with having the dice play, can absolutely interrupt that flow for you. So if you don't like any element of randomness in your Euro or worker placement game, then it may well be that this is not the game for you because for me, it excites and enjoys me in equal measures there. I absolutely love the fact that I can go in there with six dice and I can lose to an enemy just rolling one dice. And it's great because it just throws this kind of curveball and makes me change, <coughs> excuse me, how I'm thinking about the game. However, if dice aren't your thing, then maybe, maybe this game isn't for you. The biggest thing for me is nothing to do with the gameplay. Nothing at all. I love every element of this gameplay. I've yet to have a bad game of Dwellings of Elder Vale in maybe the 10 times I've played it now. I'm simply in love with this game. But the biggest thing for me, uh, and I say it's not a gameplay thing, it's the accessibility of more. As I say, I, I didn't back this at Kickstarter. My fault, obviously, to not do that. <laughs> But that means that what is available to, uh, to people that bought the Legendary Edition isn't available to me. And, and as it stands at the moment, breaking games, and it may well change, and Luke, uh, please listen to this, I would love to find a way to maximise my uh, experience with uh, Dwellings of Elder Vale. I want to get my hands on the Legendary add-ons. At the moment, the only way to do that is to sell my deluxe copy and pay more money to try and get the Legendary copy, which is not always readily available for people and you know, maybe it'll be available in some stores, etc. Um, and I don't want to do that. I want to have the ability to get those additional monsters. I want to have the ability to get those sound bases as kind of flavour they are. You know, I just want to maximise that experience. And that's my biggest gripe of, of a game. And if this is the only gripe I've got, then it's a relatively small one is at present, if you haven't, if you love the game and you've gone for the standard or the deluxe, there's no way to upgrade your computer components to the and, and get the additional monsters etc that you're going to get not too much of a problem you know you get these eight monsters and nine with the um, with the mother of dragons mini expansion which is good and that changes gameplay completely there uh, and uh, talking about mini expansions you do also get this kind of um, uh, the oracle as i mentioned you get the uh, dragon's den which is the mother of dragons there's a separate dungeon tile for four to five players which does something uh, slightly different there uh, there's the tactics which I haven't touched upon, there's the mercenaries which I haven't touched upon as well. So there's lots to add into the game, but I still want more, and that's my biggest gripe of the game is at present, uh, I got the deluxe. Um, it's all that was available and all I could afford at the time, uh, but right now I would just love to have a way that I could upgrade this to the legendary edition. There is just one more thing, and that comes in regard to these wonderful, wonderful player boards. These are great. You put all your chips in, you snap your lid on top, and it keeps everything nice. And of course, it's a double-sided lid. The problem being is that the more you, you put your lids on there, the more you snap them, then there's more chance of them becoming damaged. And I don't know if you can pick this up on the camera, but mine are becoming ever so slightly damaged there. Now, there are ways around that. I've seen people kind of put glue dots on there or maybe cut a bit off with a with a, uh, with a a craft knife, etc. It's a minor thing, but over time, if you enjoy the game as much as I do, then there's a real chance that these lids could start to be um, uh, damaged. Uh, and that's a shame, you know, uh, I think as brilliant as all the storage solutions are, this relatively minor thing, which does have some quick fixes, which I'm going to have to look into, is just a recurring thing for people. But again, it's relatively low. I think given everything else that you get in terms of component quality, in terms of gameplay, in terms of uh, just the sheer amount of variability that you get here, all of those quirks are really scraping the bottom of the barrel to find out what's wrong with this game. I've done a real whistle-stop whistle tour of the game. There is so much depth in every move that you play in the game. It's deceptively deep in the fact that your early goes, you think you can only play two moves, but once you start kind of comboing your cards together and you know trying to decide your strategy on where you're going to place your worker, because if you place it in a certain way, there may be a way that, you know, there's a, a, a good chance that the uh, ghost AI is going to have to place his 
unit in a particular place which may trigger a battle with the monster and you start to work out all these deep strategies you know it is an absolutely fantastic game i cannot recommend dwellings of eldervale enough in a sea of games that have arrived this year either from kickstarters or ones that i've bought or have been sent to me by publishers this came out of left field when i ordered it i think uh from games law at the back end of october and it was delivered uh about three or four weeks ago um it came out of left field as i say i didn't back the kickstarter and i've so much fallen in love with this game as a solo experience it is an absolutely fantastic game as you can see from what i'm trying to find wrong with it it doesn't really have that many things wrong with it. A lot of them cosmetic, a little bit to do with the fact I can't get some stuff that if I'd have spent more money initially, I would have got. Uh, and about the fact that if you don't like dice tricking, it may not be the game for you. Other than that, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this game. And I'm calling this right now that in a year of many, many games, Dwellings of Eldervale is my favourite solo release for 2020. It's my number one brand new game released in 2020. I am so excited to get this to the table. I am so enamored to sit down for maybe 90 minutes and play this game. Whether I win or lose is an irrelevance. It's all about the journey, learning new tactics, playing with new factions. There is just so much excitement in this game, moving those monsters around, maybe dominating a monster, maybe understanding that, oh, if I made this decision earlier, I could have got that card, which would have allowed me to do this and get more victory points. And you've got a really smart AI in, in the terms the Ghosts of Eldervale. So for me, I cannot recommend, it's a stone cold recommendation for Dwellings of Eldervale. It's the not board gaming solo release of 2020. Wow, and that's how you end the year on a bang, to have something like this come along and completely blow away everything else that you've got in the year. There's some great games I've played this year, some games that really did nudge it, some re-releases and expansions this year, which you know, I wouldn't really class as solo releases for this year. They're more of expansions to games, but this latecomer has come right back in at the back end of the year and absolutely blown away all the competition for me. I'm in love with this game. If you can seek out a copy of Dwellings of Eldervale, as a solo player, you will not regret this purchase. There is so much to appeal to many different types of gamers here. So thank you very much for joining me on what is potentially the final review of 2020 for Not Board Gaming and what a year it's been in so many respects. I will be publishing my top 10 solo games I played in 2020 list by the back end of the year. And that's not just new releases, that's all of the games I played this year and what I think are the top 10 solo experiences. So watch out for that on the channel. Once again, thank you very much for joining me. My name is Mark. This is not board gaming. Remember that you can uh, watch it. You can join us on Facebook, on Instagram, or on Twitter. That's always not board gaming. That's always B O R E D. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Check out our other videos. Have a cracking Christmas and a wonderful New Year. And a final thought for the year: If you can't find anybody to play with, there's nothing wrong with playing with yourselves. Until next time.